Episode 18 of Fate Grand Order Babylonia was nothing short of a visual masterpiece, with much of the stellar animation being attributed to Quetzalcoatl's noble phantasms. Of course, if you're not familiar with the game, then everything she did likely didn't make much sense. Like, how was she able to attack Tiamat with what was pretty much the sun itself? And how was she able to replicate the impact of the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs? Well, as all things are in the Fate universe, everything is tied to a deeper mythology. The quick version is that she's pretty much a literal alien turned god, but there's definitely more to it than just that. And although it may not make much sense now, I promise that by the end of this video you'll have a better understanding on who Quetzalcoatl is and why she's so damn strong. Seriously, bringing Tiamat to her knees is quite a big deal. So let's start with her origins then move on to her abilities and noble phantasms. Let's begin. Yes. Much like Merlin, Quetzalcoatl's historical mythology isn't one that can be narrowed down to a singular origin. From this deity's earliest conception in literally the first century, all the way to where we are now, this Mesoamerican figure of worship has numerous variations to its story. Reason being that changes in culture over time result in different interpretations of beings like Quetzalcoatl to emerge along with it. This means that there's no single official myth for him. But before I simply give you the fate version, I can at least try to present a general overview as to who this god was. At its core, Quetzalcoatl refers to a feathered serpent, imagined as a mix of bird and snake. The name is a combination of the emerald feathered bird Quetzal and the serpent Kotal. To the Mayans, he was considered to be a god of agriculture, winds, and rain. To the Toltec, he became an existence that was closely associated with Venus, becoming a symbol related to death and resurrection. Finally, he would become a highly central god to the Aztec culture, one that would be mentioned in many myths of creation as the son of a primordial god. You see, before there was anything, there was simply a void in the rest of the universe. From this void, the first god would create itself, and it would later give birth to four children each of whom would preside over one of the four cardinal directions. Quetzalcoatl's domain was the east, the south was the god of war, the west was the god of gold, farming, and spring, and the north was the god of judgment, night, and deceit. The way it worked for them was that in order to create something they first had to destroy, and through this cycle of creation and destruction eventually came the earth. But the earth created back then is not the earth we know today. According to legend, the world had been destroyed four times over before finally being recreated through Quetzalcoatl's own blood. The first world was created by Tezcatlipoca, though in order for his world to continue to exist, a sun needed to be formed. So Tezcatlipoca turned himself into the sun. However, being the god of night meant that his brightness wasn't ever quite enough. Quetzalcoatl grew dissatisfied with his brother's meager performance, and over time their rivalry would grow. Eventually, Quetzalcoatl couldn't take it anymore, so he decided to knock his brother out of the sky with a stone club, leaving his people in a world of complete darkness. Because of this, the world was no longer to his liking, so Tezcatlipoca ordered his jaguars to eat all of the people. Quetzalcoatl would become the next son for a new group of people created by the gods, but because Quetzal was a god of mercy, he never really demanded much from them. Over time, these people would grow to become less and less civilized, even forgetting to worship the very gods who created them. This didn't sit too well with Tezcatlipoca, and as the god of judgment, he deemed them unsuitable to be humans. So he would use his power to turn Quetzalcoatl's people into monkeys. The thing is, Quetzal loved his people, even as flawed as they were. So when he saw that they were no longer what made them special, he wiped them all out with a mighty hurricane then let the next god become the sun. Two more gods would try and inevitably fail at being the sun for their world. By the fifth, Quetzalcoatl could no longer accept the destruction of his people, so he went to the underworld, stole their bones, then resurrected them into a brand new world using his own blood. With this second chance, Quetzal's people now knew that they had to fear the power of the gods. They began to continuously offer human and blood sacrifices in order to appease them. Of course, Quetzalcoatl didn't really approve of this, but his people knew that if those sacrifices stopped, then the fifth sun would go dark and their existence would end. This is how Quetzalcoatl became known to be a god of creation, and I believe that it's this story that was used to influence his fate version the most.
So now that the myth has made it all the way to present day, that means that we're lucky enough to see this prominent figure become one of our waifus in the Nasuverse interpretation of him. It's one that doesn't go very deep like how Sabres or Gilgamesh's does, but it does broaden the scope as to what a heroic spirit can be. So let's take a look at how exactly Quetzalcoatl evolved into this Lucha Libre loving goddess of peace. First, we need to go back tens of millions of years, back to a time when dinosaurs still walked the earth. In an area known as the Yucatan Peninsula, a meteorite could be seen plummeting towards the planet. The eventual impact of this space rock would result in a mass extinction event of the dinosaurs, paving the way for a new form of life to become the dominant species on the planet. Unbeknownst to many, this astronomical object was the host to a form of microorganism from a far and ancient universe. It wasn't an invasive species though, it was more so just a being that was adrift in space. Only after it had coincidentally found its way to Earth did this bacteria start to infect the land. Similar to a parasite, the bacteria would infect a host then take complete control over its body, almost as if it was possessing it. At first they would simply possess animals, but as time went on, they began to find humans to be an even more suitable host. These possessed humans would demonstrate a power far beyond what was considered normal. As a result, the people of this time began to elevate these possessed humans to the rank of God, worshipping them as superior beings worthy of ruling over humanity. The collective unconscious of mankind, better known as Gaia or the world itself, witnessed this alien species rise above the rest. So Gaia deemed them worthy of possessing administrative privileges over the world, granting them a power known as authority. Just like how she gave these privileges to the Greek, Norse, and Mesopotamian gods, so too did these Mesoamerican gods now have the right to manipulate the world. Depending on the type of authority you had, this could include anything from the control or creation of certain elements to the manipulation of time itself. For example, let's say that you were declared the god of fire, then your domain would be fire and you'd now have authority over it. What this meant is that, regardless of your circumstances, you could now do whatever you wanted with fire. Create it, extinguish it, make it jump through hoops, whatever you wanted. Essentially you were given the rights to bypass and overwrite any law of the world that pertained to fire. So these alien bacteria who then became ruling figures over humanity were now classified by Gaia as beings equal to the gods. By right, they are divine spirits. Two of these bacteria who we know became gods are Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca. Quetzalcoatl was the goddess of the sun and all that is good, giving her authority over those two aspects. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that implies that she could spawn a literal sun if she wanted to. But anyway, originally possessing a male, Quetzalcoatl was a very righteous god to his people. Similar to his actual myth, he loved humanity for what it was. So he deemed human sacrifices to be unnecessary unlike Tezcatlipoca. But this merciful approach to ruling over his people began to anger Tez. Eventually, Quetzal would incur Tez's wrath, and the two would engage in a fight that Quetzal would inevitably lose. The shame that this defeat brought caused Quetzal to flee to Venus. He abandoned his Aztec people. The only thing they could do was prophesize of the one day that he would return. Some Aztec believed that his return was when the Spanish invaded. They thought it was Quetzalcoatl's will to have the Aztec people be wiped out. Whether that was the case or not, we know that he did in fact return, jumping between human hosts until eventually reaching the female form that we see in the anime. However, she didn't return to rule. Instead, she foresaw that humanity could rise up on their own to become a great civilization. She wanted nothing more than to be able to see the people she loved thrive. So in order to make that happen, she and the other gods retreated to the jungle and halted all interactions that they had with humanity. It was the first step needed to allow humanity to become independent from the Mesoamerican Age of Gods. Quetzalcoatl would spend the rest of her time monitoring humanity from a distance, dreaming of that one day where she can bear witness to this vision of humanity becoming a prosperous species. Now, gods are divine spirits that aren't typically recorded in the throne of heroes, but Mesoamerican gods are an exception. They're a unique case of divine spirit that can be summoned normally as servants to the Holy Grail. Reason being that their human hosts along with the bacteria infecting them are recorded into the throne. They're in existence known as Bunere, essentially a clone or copy of a divine spirit from a particular point in time. The Quetzalcoatl we see in the anime is the Quetzalcoatl as she was while possessing that human. It's the version of her that was recorded into the throne of heroes. And unless there's another recording of her while she was possessing a different human, then this would be the version of her that's always summoned. Anyway. That's pretty much all there is about her lore and origins. 
Now let's take a look at what exactly we saw in episode 18, the power that brought Tiamat to her knees. You gotta keep in mind though, that wasn't even Quetzalcoatl's true power. If you recall back in episode 14, her divinity was cut by more than half because Merlin decided to be a troll. Still though, her noble phantasms are quite clearly very powerful, even with the handicap. But before we dive deeper into those, let's first talk about her skills and abilities. As a rider class servant, riding is naturally one of her class skills, giving her the ability to operate all vehicles and beasts freely. This also includes a wide array of dragons because she is also considered to be a goddess of dragons. Other basic skills include a high level of magic resistance and a natural talent to command people via her charisma, a standard skill for anyone who has had experience ruling over others. A more unique ability is her goddess's divine core. This represents the perfection of being a goddess since birth. It preserves both Quetzalcoatl's mind and body completely, nullifying any mental interferences and preventing the body from aging and changing. In a similar vein, she also has what's called Good God's Wisdom, a skill that stems from having shared wisdom with many people. I mean, Quetzalcoatl was known for blessing others with the knowledge of agriculture and fire. She taught her people many things to help them advance, and because of that, she now possesses the very powerful skill of Good God's Wisdom. What it does is allow her to use any skill that isn't characteristic to a single person with a very high level of proficiency. Not only that, but she can also give others the ability to use that skill as well, and they don't even have to be servants. If she wanted, Quetzalcoatl could give Fujimaru skills that other servants possess that under normal circumstances wouldn't be possible for him to use. It's a very, very powerful skill, but also requires a lot of magical energy to use. Finally, Quetzalcoatl has what's called free wrestling. This is simply her love for Lucha Libre manifesting itself as a skill. Now, you might be wondering how exactly did she get the opportunity to witness professional wrestling? Well, apparently she was summoned into an age where she could watch it. That's about as much as we know. The reason she liked it so much was because of how these wrestlers flew through the air as if they had wings. It was a spectacle so breathtaking that it heavily appealed to the side of her that was a goddess of wind. It brought forth a curiosity that in turn manifested itself into her personality, giving her a persona resembling that of a luchadora. It was such a deeply rooted passion that she even goes so far as to re-establish the foundations of one of her noble phantasms, making it more wrestling oriented. And you'll see exactly how really soon. So what are her noble phantasms anyway? I suppose the best to start off with would be the one that classifies her into the rider class. Quetzalcoatl, the Winged Serpent, an ability that summons one of the largest known flying animals ever for her to ride. It's a pterosaur from the Jurassic Age whose name derives from Quetzalcoatl herself. However, the one that she summons aren't your average everyday Quetzalcoatlus from the Cretaceous period. No, these Quetzalcoatlus are a phantasmal species. They're divine beasts far more powerful than their prehistoric counterparts. Just as their master has authority over lightning, winds, and rain, they too have the ability to manipulate these aspects of the world. So the winged dinosaurs that we see everyone riding in Babylonia are in fact a noble phantasm attributed to Quetzalcoatl. Her next noble phantasm was the one that she first used on Tiamat, better known as Piedro del Sol, the Sunstone. In episode 11, it was the monolith that we saw at the top of her temple of worship. But back during the era of the Aztecs, it was a megalith that allowed them to observe the past and the future. Whether it still has the ability to do that or not is unclear. But what we do know is that as Quetzalcoatl's primary symbol of worship, it provides her with a significant portion of her divinity, and subsequently her power. As a goddess of the sun, calling this noble phantasm's true name opens up a gate that releases a portion of her authority, that being the authority of the sun. It allows her to unleash these solar winds over a large area that proceed to scorch everything in its path, almost as if she was burning the area with the sun itself. When we see her use it on Tiamat, the ability was so strong that not only did it burn away a majority of Tiamat's mud, but it also turned the ground into molten lava. Obviously, it's a bit more useful for taking out a large number of enemies. I mean, it is thought to have enough power to completely vaporize Uruk on impact. But if she wanted to focus on a single target, then her third noble phantasm would be better. This one is called Ziukoto, flame, burn even gods to ashes. The name itself is very fitting because it's meant to represent a weapon of the sun. For Quetzalcoatl, it's a noble phantasm that symbolizes the conflict between herself and Tezcatlipoca. You see, after being beaten in the fight and before leaving for Venus, 
Quetzalcoatl decided to burn down her own temple. She would much rather see it in ashes than allow Tezcatlipoca to gain the treasures inside. So, it's this grand spectacle of a temple on fire that was the inspiration for this noble phantasm. Initially, it would simply involve flames surrounding and enveloping the target. Within these flames, enemies would be prevented from unleashing their noble phantasm's true name. However, after Quetzalcoatl's slight addiction to wrestling, she decided to modify it a bit, changing it into something closer associated to her passion. And honestly, it seems a lot more powerful with these new changes. Her modifications led to two potential ways in which this noble phantasm could be used. The first is a literal pile driver from space. Of course, it wouldn't be one of her noble phantasms if the target wasn't completely enveloped in flames as well. So basically what happens is Quetzalcoatl grabs her opponent, tosses them into the sky, then jumps and grabs them mid-air and proceeds to slam them headfirst into the ground. This obviously wasn't what happened to Tiamat, but we do get to see a classic pile driver in episode 11. Tiamat got hit with what I would consider to be the stronger variation to this noble phantasm. As great as it would have been to see Tiamat get piledrivered straight to the underworld, it was pretty hyped to see the reenactment of a mass extinction event. Normally, Quetzalcoatl would just jump thousands of meters into the air and fall from space to dropkick an enemy with as much force as she could, and of course all while being surrounded by her flames. But the variant that we saw in the anime was significantly stronger. Before jumping into space, she first absorbed all the power output from Piedro del Sol. This allowed her to enhance Zyukotl to the point where it would have an effect similar to a meteorite's impact, striking an enemy with the same power that once annihilated most life on Earth. Just as how she was brought to Earth by that meteorite, she can replicate its power and impact by combining her noble phantasms together, resulting in the ultimate ability that she personally refers to as... <laughs> Yeah, that episode was just too great not to do the servant profile. But yeah, that's pretty much everything about her lore and power. Quetzalcoatl truly is a kind and passionate god. It's her dream to witness humanity open up the path to an era where all could be happy. And she'll do whatever it takes to help humanity reach that goal. Sure, she may seem ruthless at times, but it's a rage that is only ever directed towards those who don't value life. As a god who refused human sacrifices due to her love for humanity, she won't hesitate to end any person who would be considered humanity's enemy. She'll put on a very devious smile when fighting these types of people. It's a distinct face that's meant to show her distaste towards them. All in all, she's definitely one of the more kind-hearted divine spirits, always putting on a shining and sympathetic disposition as if she was the sun herself. That's just how she is and not even being summoned with the purpose of destroying humanity could change that. Anyway, since Ishtar won the previous poll, I suppose that she'll be the servant that I cover next. Also, if you haven't already, then be sure to check out my Merlin and Gilgamesh profiles as well. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!